Hey, hey, hello guys, how are you doing? Welcome to number nine in a row of our lockdown webinars. I hope you're well, I hope you had a good day, and I hope, you to, I hope you're ready to go into a topic that I used to struggle with in a huge way. Renal, I used to hate doing this, both in medical school, through two exams in going through GP training. I used to really struggle with renal. I don't know about you guys, but this was a sore topic for me. Hi, Abba, hi, Sana, hi, Abhishek. Hi, Amna, Rajkumari, Nida, Hid, Mohit, Dinzar. How are you guys doing? Welcome back. I see some of you guys coming back for number nine, I think. Hi, Bala. Yeah, same here. I struggled. Yeah, but I hear you. I hear you. Hi, Bimbola. How are you doing? Hi, Felipe. Hi, Uma. Hi, Amy. Good to see some names again that I've been seeing over the last eight weeks. You must be fed up of my voice, but hopefully it's still working. It's still keeping you motivated. It's still keeping you up in these really, really challenging times. Thank you so much for coming on board. Once again, we had another 400 plus signups today and we've got another 170 odd on right now and hopefully that's gonna grow over the next five or 10 minutes. So as always, I always check in and try and find out who has been an ever present. So if this is your ninth in a row, please give me a shout. Let me know, number nine, fantastic Amit, well done. That means you've already had eight hours of teaching. So this is gonna be your ninth hour. Number nine, Abba, fantastic. Thank you guys for everybody who's been here for all nine. Hi Raj Kumari, hi Mariam. Amazing, amazing commitment to come back nine evening, nine weeks in a row. And I don't know if you remember, but the very first one we did cardiology, I remember sitting in this chair and it was dark and now it's still so bright and it's just a different world. But, but you guys are amazing and thank you so much for the support. Um, that you give to me and the, and the support that you show and then the support you have done and and you guys have been so awesome in bringing other people in as well I'm really grateful for you guys for dragging people along to these evening webinars in fact let me know if this is your first one are you on board for the very first time give me a shout for you as well because you're just as amazing let me know who is here for their number one the very first one Salma fantastic hi Bala how are you doing good to see some first timers Hopefully you've managed to go back and watch some of the other ones. Hi, Ashwarya. Hi, Elto. Welcome. Hopefully you're going to find this useful. And hopefully even if it's your first one, you've managed to watch back some of the other ones because they're all on the website to watch back. And hopefully you can make um, some use of the previous ones as well. So I think we're probably good enough to go. We've got 200 plus now on board. So there are some people still trying to log in. So they'll hopefully join us at some point soon. So what have we covered talking about previous webinars? We started way back, like I said, in March, end of March, gosh, when lockdown started, cardiology, ENT, respiratory, psychiatry, neuro, pediatrics, derm, women's health. The cardiology one now has had, I think, over 2,000 views on YouTube. So it's getting a lot of watch and the rest have hit well over 1,000. So you guys are really um supporting us like i said in 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 going through these and and hopefully they're adding some value to your preparation so if you go to the website um auramedicaleducation.co.uk slash lockdown webinars you'll be able to watch all of these and you'll get the renal one as well hopefully tomorrow morning if we can get that up on the site so a couple of other videos on there as well that are worth watching how to stay motivated and a lot of people are struggling with that especially now exams are coming um, and obviously minds have been in totally different worlds um, over the last couple of months. And now you've got to somehow get back and sit down and start doing some work. And it's not easy. So A, we're trying to help you here, but B, there's a couple of tips on here that might help. Um, there's an update video on the RCA. I'll talk about a, a webinar we're doing on Thursday um, for the RCA assessment. And there's an interview that we did last week with the OSCGB AIT chair. And it's worth watching that if you just trying to understand how these exams have come about and how um, things have changed over the last few months. So what are we going to talk about today then? So of course, we're going to talk our usual brief exam update. We're going to do our, our heavy renal teaching, which I find really difficult. Um, and as a GP trainee, lots of questions, lots of presentation to think about how you deal with these things and things like RCA or CSA when it starts up again, or PLAB2 when it starts up again. Um, we'll talk about some of the upcoming webinars that we're doing over the next couple of weeks. This, by the way, is our last official category-based lockdown webinar. We've done nine now. I think it's kind of come to its natural end, but we're starting up with our exam-focused webinars. I think people's minds are now shifting from just simply staying up to date into, okay, that's great, but let me get through these exams. So we're going to start. Uh, I'll talk about what, what webinars are coming up very shortly. And yesterday we had a huge bank holiday sale and, and loads of you took advantage of it. 
but I got quite a few messages say about people saying that I, I didn't realize there was a bank holiday sale and I, I totally missed out. And of course, you're busy doing other things on a bank holiday. So we're going to reopen up that 15% sale for anything on the website today. That's day courses, virtual courses, online courses, audio courses, posters, gold packages, the works. And I'll tell you the code later on. So it's three hours from when I release that code until midnight tonight. And it's I think it's is it how, how many we've got this? 15 codes we've got available today. So 15 will be open from that time when I mentioned that code. And another competition. Well then to Tar Cooper today, who got another, who got the one from last week. We're just going to send her an AKT post. I think she asked, what was it AKT? I think it was AKT she asked. That'll be on its way tomorrow. There'll be another one up for grabs and I'll explain how to do that slightly different this week to the last few weeks. So what worries you in real then? I'm going to cover quite a lot of stuff. CKD is a huge topic in itself. Lots of areas that we're going to talk about in CKD. We're going to look at abnormalities of the urine that you might see when you're doing your day-to-day -day, um, practice for exams, renal stones, AKI, the, the old kind of or the new kind of acute um, kidney disease, I suppose, or acute renal failure, nephritis, renal vascular stuff, nephrotic versus nephritic, and then look at some of the end-stage stuff around Renal problems, what do you struggle with? Already people are saying classification of CKD. Yes, I hated classification of CKD. We're going to make that super, super simple today. So you know exactly what to do when it comes up in a medical exam. And there are two, of course, I'm gonna talk about both of those. Renal bone disease, we'll talk a bit about renal bone disease as well. What goes up, what goes down, really, really simple way to remember it. And we're gonna cover that later on today. Everything about renal, yes, every, that, was, that was me. Everything about renal really, really, really scared me back in the day. But it's actually really simple, and we're going to make it really simple for you today. Yes, it overlaps with cardio, absolutely. Prescribing in CKD, when to refer. Glomerular nephropathies, yes, we're going to break that down, Shireen, today for sure. Philippe, we're going to talk about when to refer. Yes, all these things um, are challenging. Well, actually, not for everybody. Um, some people find real really easy, but I really struggle. Blood results, yes, we're going to talk about those as well. So lots and lots and lots of things we're going to cover. So brief overview about exams. Not much has changed in the last seven days. So AKT, of course, two sittings, 15th July, 19th August. Um, some of you guys, particularly for the July sitting, have started to prepare for this now. So I'm going to talk about how we can help you going forward. CSA, of course, temporarily replaced by the new RCA format. And we're going to do a webinar on this on Thursday, like I mentioned, to try and take you guys through what's happening with this. And this is only temporarily for people who are due to CCD before 30 September. And officially, anyone after this, the hope is, I guess, that CSA is back up and running. But this could change, of course, given um, the fluidity of what's going on at the moment. GP stays to be cancelled. And congratulations, by the way, to any of you guys. Anyone do MSRA? Anyone got your results today? Let me know if we have any new GP trainees in the house today. Lots of people got offers today for GP training starting in August. Congratulations to you. Well done, Thins are Super, super news. Well done, Joe. Well done, Ricky. Well done, Amna. So some new GP trainees in the house today. Look at you guys getting ahead of the game and starting to look at um, preparation for your exams already. Amazing stuff. I hope you're celebrating because you deserve it. PLAB2 back on from 1st of July. We'll have some webinars for PLAB2 coming up soon. I'll tell you about those later. And PLAB1 is continuing from June as per the GMC website. So not much change, um, but still developments to come. So a quick mention about the two webinars that are, are most or are coming up soon. We have our RCA update on Thursday evening at 8.30. So if you're taking the RCA assessment or if you think you might be in the category um, eventually where you come around to need this, we're going to go through everything that you need to know for the RCA or everything that we know right now in terms of how to prepare, how to max out your 10 minutes and how to make it work for you in place of the CSA. And then this time next week, we're going to do our AKT six-week check. I don't know if you guys know, but that next week on Tuesday, you're going to be six weeks away from AKT on the 15th of July. So we're going to make sure we are getting you in zone for that, getting you prepared to make your six weeks work as hard as you can. We're going to do some questions. I'm going to get your brain into AKT zone. Give me a hands up if you're doing AKT in July. Let's see how many people are on today. And then we'll see how many people are going to be on next week. So quite a few of you, Abba Rasemi, Mark, Andrew, uh, not heard back. Yeah, of course, some of you guys are still waiting, but but um, there's quite a few hands up coming. So hopefully we'll see you on um, the webinar next week. You can sign up to this already. If you go to the lockdown webinar page, both of these webinars you can sign up to right now. OK, let's get into it then. So quick question one. A 64-year-old female patient attends with vague symptoms. You notice a gradual deterioration in renal function 
over the last year. Can you throw at me some possible symptoms or presentations that this patient may come to see you with when it comes to chronic renal failure? Give me some, some things that you may see or they may tell you about. So we've got a few answers flying in. So we've got anemia, we've got fatigue, tiredness, itch, pallor, pedal edema, tiredness, leg swelling, anemia, anorexia, malaise, loss of appetite, itching, ankle edema. So lots and lots of re repetition, which is great. Facial puffiness, shortness of breath, tiredness, fatigue, with current UTI, well done. Um, so lots and lots and lots and lots of answers. But as you can see, they're all pretty vague things, aren't you? So people are not going to come in with things that stand out classically as renal failure, but you're going to have to have that that in your mind for many, many, many different presentations. Like people mentioned earlier, there's a big overlap between lots of um, systems, cardiac system, um, et cetera, which makes it difficult. So say someone comes in and you're thinking, okay, this person may well have, maybe not CKD, you can't say that at this point, but some kind of renal issues going on. Let's go through a few things that you might think about. So firstly, you may simply get a low GFR result. Someone comes in had a routine UNE done and their GFRs come back low. The first thing you're going to do is repeat that GFR, right? Never go anywhere on a single GFR. Repeat it 12 hours later usually and make sure you advise basically protein free. You don't want any protein for those first 12 hours after that first blood test. And it's amazing how many times People who come in with GFRs of, I don't know, 55, 50 or whatever, to go in and repeat it again 12 hours later with no meat, for example, and it shoots right back up to 90. So that's the first thing you would do if you get a single low GFR. Of course, if you get multiple readings, then you've got to think a little bit bigger. And depending on what system you use, you may need to change or multiply the eGFR by 1.159 if you've got a patient who's of African Caribbean background or African background. Because sometimes you have, obviously in GP practice now, if someone has ethnicity entered in their data, this might happen automatically. But just be aware for medical exams that you may need to multiply the eGFR by 1.159 to get a more accurate result. So CKD then, abnormality of kidney function for more than three months. So it's got to be something that's gone on for a period of time for it to come in the CKD category. Now, when you get someone with CKD and they come in, it can be a really worrying thing. Doctor, oh, my kidney's failing. Like, what's happened? And then my kidneys are really important. What's going to happen to me? And you've got to obviously take time to explain this. And we'll go through these in a few slides time. But we've got to talk about why it's so important that we do something about this. Because there's actually a couple of reasons why we should take action now that we know you've got what we call CKD. Remember, you've got to do two things. You've got to reduce their progression to end-stage kidney disease, and we'll be talking about that later on in the webinar. And ultimately, of course, you want to reduce their cardiovascular risk because there's a huge link between CKD and increasing cardiovascular risk. If you remember right back to the very, very first webinar that we did, do you remember when we talked about doing risk assessments, things like Q-risk? One of the reasons that you don't do a Q-risk is if someone has CKD. Why? Because CKD puts them at high risk category already. So it's another reason why we need to find this as early as we can and then take action um, to do something about it. Why could this lady be having CKD? Obviously, multiple, multiple reasons. And part of your workup is going to be trying to figure out what the underlying reason could be if there is an underlying reason. There's not always an underlying reason, of course, but things like hypertension should come to mind, diabetes should come to mind. You should look at the medications they're taking. We'll go through these in a second. And then outflow obstruction as well. So thinking about things like BPH, obviously not for this lady, but look, thinking about obstructive causes or post-renal causes. And we'll talk about those later on as well. Mrs. X, we talked about symptoms. Can I just run through a couple of symptoms that might be associated with things like kidney problems? They might seem a little bit odd, but it's just common things that we tend to see. I'm going to run through a few. Remember, signposting things is so important. We know why we need to ask questions, but role players and patients do not often know why questions need to happen. So for us, it might be second nature to run through things like, have you got tiredness, vomiting, ankle swelling? But they're thinking, well, where, where, where does this come from? I came with something completely different. Why are you asking about vomiting? So it's about signposting things. And remember, signposts are not just for the role player in exams like this. The signpost is for you as well. So if you don't signpost things clearly, then you're not going to get things out in a structured way. If you give yourself a signpost, you're much more likely to go through things in a structured way because you're kind of hinting to your brain that, right, this is what I need to do now. So signposts, we always talk about being really important, yes, for the person listening, and yes, for the person who's examining or marking, but it's super, super important for your own brain as well. And I think that's probably one of the biggest reasons why we need to signpost what we do. Okay, so quick question two. Eventually, further down the line, she gets a diagnosis of CKD and she has some more blood tests. Her latest results are as below, GFR 28 
ACR 28. Now, people talk about classification and they struggle with this. So what stage of CKD would this lady come under? GFR 28, ACR 28, what are you going to tell her in terms? Doctor, I've been told there are various stages. What stage do I have? Right, let's look at some of the answers. So, tell me, don't be straight in there. Stage four, um, stage four, Anita, stage four, and me, stage four, lots of stage fours. We've got G5A2, G4A3, N stage, stage 4A2, 4 stage 2, G3A2, stage five, lots and lots of numbers coming out. Now, what's really interesting here is straight away we're getting a split in terms of about half of you are giving me the old CKD system, about half of you are giving me the new CKD system. This is why it's really important that you know both. There are two systems, so she would, in, in essence, come under two classifications here, and it's important to know both of them. How many of you are confident in being able to do both systems in terms of CKD stages? Just give me a yes if you are. I'd be super, super amazed if you are, because I still can't do it without looking things up. Some of you are amazing, Rana, um, very good, really happy to do it, fantastic. That's that's super, super good. I find it really, really difficult. Most people say no, 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 not a clue. From your online course, good, good. If that helped and that's one thing you learned, fantastic. Nancy, good. Okay, so let's look at this. So what has she got? She got GFR 20A and ACR 20A. So if you're looking at the traditional stage, we'll go through this um, step by step in a second. If you look at the traditional staging, she's at stage four. So if you put stage four, correct, that's absolutely right. What you may find though these days is that when you get letters from secondary care, when you look at things like guidelines, they don't really have this staging system. They have the newer GA system. So you've got to be able to flick between both when it comes to medical exams. So in terms of GA, she would have, what did she have? She'd have, she'd have G4 and then she'd have A2. And I'll go through this as a G4, A2. So if you wrote either stage four or G4, A2, super impressed, well done. Okay, so two stages. Look at the traditional stage. The one that you probably learned back in medical school, like GA staging wasn't really used at that stage. So what do you, when the traditional staging is based on two things. Number one, what's their GFR level? And then number two, is there any other evidence of kidney damage? Now let's start with just the GFR first. Now the first thing that people do when they try and learn these numbers, and I made this mistake myself, is they try and learn downwards. Now when you learn downwards, it gets very complex. If you start from the bottom and go up, it's actually pretty simple. Think of it as doubling. So stage five is less than 15. Then when it goes up to four, it's double, 30. Then it goes up to three, it doubles again, up to 60. And then it goes back up to 90. So if you remember 15, 30, 60, 90, it's much easier, firstly, to get your head around those numbers. Now, if you have a GFR of below 60, anything below 60 is CKD. You don't need anything else with it. You just need a GFR below 60. So the moment someone has a GFR of 59, they have stage three CKD. However, if someone has a GFR of 61, very close here, you can only be a stage two CKD patient if you have other evidence of chronic kidney damage. So that's just covered up there, chronic kidney damage. And this could be one of these four things, persistent microalbuminuria, persistent proteinuria, hematuria, as long as you've ruled out other causes, and any kind of structural abnormality of the kidney. So, for example, if you have someone with a GFR of 64, but they don't have any other evidence of chronic kidney disease, they do not have stage 2 CKD. However, if that person with a GFR of 64 goes on to develop one of these things, then it becomes stage 2 CKD. Now, stage 1 CKD is someone with a normal GFR, but with one of these things. So you could have CKD with a GFR of 90, or, or actually, what, very quickly, what is the normal average adult GFR. What do we think? Yes, yeah, so a lot of answers coming in at over 90, but a lot of answers coming in at 125 as well. So well done, 125 is the, you, you, you and me right now, most people on this webinar should have a GFR of around 125 or, or, or maybe just below. Anything above 90 is considered normal. So you could have a GFR of 115, but if you had say, I don't know, um, cysts on the kidney, for example, maybe, then you would have stage one CKD because it's dependent on other evidence of chronic kidney damage. Now, does that make sense firstly? Because if you don't get this, these numbers right, you can't do the next bit. So does that make sense firstly? Is that kind of similar, made things a bit more simple in your mind? Okay, good, excellent. Now, GA staging takes into account 
two things. Number one, the GFR, like we talked about, and, and G1 to 5 just means your stage 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 here. So the numbers are based on the same as these numbers. So you have to learn these anyway. But the A is based on your ACR. You can have A1, A2, or A3. A1 is if your ACR is less than 3. A2 is if your ACR is between 3 and 30. That's why this lady is A2. She had an ACR of 28, remember? And then A3 is if your ACR is above 30. So this lady here has got a GFR of 28 and an ACR of 28. So her GFR comes in here. So she has G4, because it goes to that four category, and A2. So that's why this is a G4, A2 lady. Does that make sense? So a lot of people say, oh, just learn the GA, just learn the GA. But there's no point just learning the GA because you need these numbers up here anyway to know what the G is all about. So you just, you might as well learn both. And once you've learned this one, then this one becomes really, really simple. And just remember the different things that you might get. You, I can easily see an AKD question coming up where someone's got GFR, but these things are in the question as well. And your brain, your medical brain, your exam mode brain just starts to work out numbers, but it doesn't look at these things and these things make a big, big difference. Sorry, what is ACR? Albumin creatinine ratio. So you'll do a urine sample and you'll measure that albumin creatinine ratio. Good, happy to move on. A lot of people said they weren't happy with classification of, of CKD. Hopefully, this just makes it simple. A lot of people saying I wasn't even, I didn't even know about the new one. This is this is in a lot of guidelines now, and it's going to probably be more and more and more, and it's going to take over this one. So you do need to know this for sure. Yep, you need to know both. But remember, you do, you you can't, you can't really know GA unless you know traditional, because you don't, you can't get the G bit if you don't know this. So yeah, you might as well learn both. And a lot of questions are coming in. Um, I will try and answer really quick ones here and now. Otherwise, I'll do other ones at the end, I promise. I'm not just going to ignore your question. It's just that it disrupts the slow of the webinar if it's a long question. Okay, quick question three. Her next set of blood tests shows an abnormal phosphate. So I was talking about bone blood test results. Is her phosphate likely to be high or low? 50% chance here, high or low. What do we think? What do we think? So we're getting, I would say, 73 30 here 70 30 i would say possibly 60 40 at high so well done if you put high really 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 simple way to remember bone and renal everything goes high when it comes to bone and renal except calcium everything goes high except calcium your calcium is going to go down but pta is going to go up phosphate going to go up alpha is going to go up just remember that right it's really really simple to remember everything goes up but calcium so this lady's phosphate is probably going to be high when you do her bone bloods. Okay, so what else are you gonna see? Of course, you're gonna get high urea, you're gonna get high creatinine, GFR is gonna go down, of course. You're gonna have that classic normocytic, normochromic anemia. And then like we said, low calcium, high pretty much everything else when it comes to bone. Now remember, you're in a presentation here, you may be in a role play situation and you have to explain what CKD is. And often we see people go into all sorts of troubles when it comes to explaining concepts like CKD, but lots of other things like heart failure and all this kind of stuff. You've got to practice this kind of stuff, you know, keep it short, sharp, simple. And we talk a lot about moving the situation on very quickly. Often what we do is we get very stuck in explaining things and want to go into more and more detail because we want people to understand more and more and more, but then you don't talk anything about what we're going to do about it. So two lines max, and Mrs. X, it's just very simple. Actually. Your kidneys, for some reason, are not working as perhaps they used to. Now, they may be damaged. They may simply be showing signs of age. But look, there's lots of things that we can do to try and reduce this causing an impact. And then you flip forward into what are the things, what are the management bits that you're going to talk about? Because if you just kind of pause there, then you're going to get questions back. Like, why are they failing? Is this really serious? What's going to happen? Am I going on to dialysis? Because, but if you just start flipping forward and kind of turn your explanations into, but look, there's a lot of things we can do about it, so let's go, then you start to buy time because you get more efficient in the way you use your management. This is what we talk a lot about in our medical how to explain audiobook. We cut these things down into two or three simple sentences so you can start to do the, the proper work of managing that situation in a consultation. Time runs very fast, as you know, in these kind of exams. A lot of questions you're still going to probably get at some point. Are my kidneys failing? Will I need dialysis? Do I need to see a specialist? We'll talk about some of these in a second. But these are the kind of questions you can almost predict to an extent what sort of questions are going to come in things like heart failure, MI, CKD. These are all kind of questions that you can almost predict and plan answers for. 
And not just plan answers to the point that you spend three minutes explaining it. Plan answers, I keep it down to one or two lines so you can keep flipping the ball forward and start talking about things that you're able to do rather than all the problems that potentially could happen. So what are we going to do with this later? So a lot of things we're going to be talking about over a period of months, I suppose. You're going to treat whatever cause it is if you think there's a cause, of course. Reduce the medications, whatever it might be. Get that blood pressure control as good as you can. Look at all the medications to make sure they're not nephrotoxic. And obviously monitor things going forward. And eventually you may be looking at things like renal replacement therapy. Um, and we'll come on to that in a little while. Quick question four. She asks if she needs a referral. Can we together, as this group of what are we now, 300, list six indications for nephrology referral according to NICE CKS when it comes to CKD? Good. A lot of people have said GFR less than 30. So that's probably the first one you need to remember. GFR less than 30. Good. Let's get some other ones. Hematuria, single kidney, rapid deterioration, ACR greater than 70. There's a few caveats to that bit. Unexplained proteinuria. Persistent proteinuria, four medications for hypertension, dialysis, hyperkalemia, ACR greater than 70, GFI less than 30, GFI less than 25%. So loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of answers coming through. Well done. Uncontrollable hypertension, genetic conditions. Some of you guys have been learning this list. Super, super happy to hear this. Renal artery stenosis. We'll come on to that later. GFI less than 15. Um, adult, uh, also a set of PKD, renal artery stenosis. Okay, loads, loads and loads and loads. Well done. There are lots and lots of reasons why you may need to get an nephrology referral. If you can't remember the whole bunch, learn the top three. Definitely learn the top three because this is stuff that you're going to be seeing on blood test results and you're going to start to have to make decisions on. So GFI less than 30. So well done. Once you get to a GFI less than 30, this person needs a nephrology referral. GFI of less or drop, sorry, by 25% in one year providing there's a change in category, but in most situations you will drop a category with 25% drop GFR in a year or GFR drop of 15 units in a year. How many people have probably had a GFR drop of 15 units in a year and have not seen nephrology? This is really important. So if you can get these three things stuck in your mind, then I think from an exam point of view, I would want to know these three. I want these to, to fly out at me, whether it's a role play based situation or whether it's an MCQ based situation. Some people have mentioned ACR. If it's 70 or above, remember, unless, remember if, unless it's diabetes. If it's diabetes, then it's slightly different categories because diabetes, you're going to have a raised ACR. Um, ACR 30 with hematuria, so not just hematuria itself. Uncontrolled hypertension, renal artery stenosis, someone mentioned. Genetic causes, well done, someone mentioned that as well. And then complications of renal disease. And you could add a, a huge list of these, but think about your anemias, think about your renal bone diseases. Again, these are things that... You might get in a question quite easily, but you would not classically think of that as one of the referral criteria. But definitely, definitely remember these three. GFR less than 30, number one. GFR dropped by 25% in a year, number two. GFR dropped by 15 units in a year, number three. So well done if you put some of those. Quick question five. She comes and asks you one day, what does oliguric mean? Because she read about it recently in a magazine. What are you going to tell her? What does oliguric mean? What are the numbers? What are the, the figures that you've got to remember for your exams? So you've got a lot of word answers here. Low urine output, moderate urine output. What about some numbers? So you've got less than 400 mil. What is that in a day, in an hour, in a week? What is it? What have we got? We've got less than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, less than three liters in a day. Kidney not making enough. So that's, so that's how you can explain it. Fair enough. Uh, less than 400 mils in 24 hours, less than 30 mil per hour, uh, less than 30 per day. Okay, so huge variation. So if you guys are sitting in the CSA right now or the RCA and someone said, doctor, what is it? What do you mean? I've read this letter. I've got it from my consultant. It was copied to me and they said I've become oliguric. What does that mean? Or I've got a relative in hospital and they've been told they got the oliguric. What does it mean? We've got to know this, right? We've got to know um, what it is so that we can explain them in detail. So well done if you said less than 400 mils per day of urine in an adult, of course, but this is an adult, so that's fine. Polyuria, greater than three liters per day. Oliguria, less than 400 mils per day. So let's look at some urine abnormalities then, because you are gonna see urine dipsticks and urine results pretty much every day of your working career, and you're gonna see them in exams as well. So let's kind of figure out what we're gonna think about if we get certain results. So what if we get a turbid urine appearance? You know, cloudiness, for example, that might indicate infection, of course, contamination, Lots of reasons why it might be a little bit turbid. pH, if it's low. 
look for it low. If it's acidic, it might mean uric acid, for example. So lots of conditions that may cause uric acid to leak out in the urine. In blood, of course, in the urine, hematuria, but it's not, it's not just hematuria. It could be hemoglobinuria, it could be myoglobinuria. So lots of other conditions can cause these. So it's not just that blood indicates pure hematuria. Of course, you, you don't want to you, you make sure you're ruling that out, of course, though. Protein, you mentioned already. So proteinuria happens when your ACR gets to a level of 30 milligrams per millimole. That is defined as proteinuria. Otherwise, you also have microalbuminuria as well when it's lower. And when you get protein in the urine, you're looking at renovascular problems, glomerular problems, tubular interstitial problems, or for some reason, you're just getting overflow of too much protein, for example, in conditions like myeloma. Glucose, of course, you've got to be screening for diabetes at that point. Ketones, of course, thinking about DKA, but also hyperemesis when you think about pregnancy. I think we talked about this last week in the Women's Health webinar and starvation as well. So ketones, very important not to miss. And then, of course, your infectin, infective indicators, sorry, things like nitrites and leukocytes. And don't forget those two values because it's important to know. So well done if you got those. Quick question six. She presents a few months later, it's a long story, this lady, with classic renal stone history. So classic loin to groin pain, very unwell. NSAIDs are not helping immediately. Now, what does NICKS suggest next? for analgesia. You've got someone who you've given NSAIDs, not working, what are you going to give? This might surprise a few people. So we've got a lot of answers coming here. So I'm not going to say the right one just yet, but well done, Rana. Well done, Anhar. So we have diclofenac, IM. We've got PR diclofenac. We've got IM morphine. We've got um, oral paracetamol, opiates, tramadol, diclofenac, pethidine, opiates, hyacine, increased fluid intake, Morphine, buscopan, diclofenac, paracetamol, dihydrocodine, fentanyl, opioids. So there's pretty much every analgesic I can think of has been answered here. Well done. So the answer, after two of you got it very quickly, actually not many people have got it, the answer according to NICKS is this, IV paracetamol is what you think about if possible. Now, of course, in primary care, this is going to be difficult, but this is what NICKS suggests. You would start with NSAIDs of any route, so it could be PR, could be all, et cetera, but if that's not working, then you've got to think about IV paracetamol. So well done if you put that down. I can't see this happening or you're giving it very often in primary care, but it's worth knowing that from a guideline point of view. Right, let's look at renal stones then. So most renal stones, around four-fifths are calcium-based and around 60% are calcium oxalate-based. So it's all, uh, the majority are due to high levels of calcium. So you're going to look for that in your blood test when you look for potential reasons, for example. But it could be uric acid levels high, it could be struvite stones, it could be cysteine stones, and of course there are lots of other reasons as well. That classic typical loin to groin pain doesn't always happen, but it can be fairly classic. Like we talked about NSAIDs, first line, um, of any route, if that's not working or contraindicated or where it might be, then it might need IV paracetamol. Now, in certain situations, you of course got to admit them to hospital. And if you're getting a, a question, an AKT or a CSA or RCA case, do not miss the admission just because you know all about the guidelines for renal stones. If they're shocked, of course, feverish, of course, if you're worried about palinophrites, of course, they're, you know, most people are going to admit those straight away. Increased risk of AKI. So someone's got CKD, for example, like this lady, maybe you're going to admit this lady to hospital, even though it's classic. Um, if they've got a history of unilateral kidney, of course, higher risk. They've got to go to hospital, dehydrated, of course. Or if you're not sure about diagnosis, there are others as well. But these should not be missed. These are the things that you're going to classify as red flags in the acute situation. So say you, you're not admitting a patient for CKS and you um, don't need to admit them. What is the next step that you're going to be doing? So you've given them analgesia. They've got better. The, the initial problem seems to settle down. No need for admission. What does a guideline suggest now in terms of what we should be doing for this patient? So a lot of people said CK, uh, CTKUB, okay. When are we going to be referring? We've got Tamsulosin coming up. We've got urine microscopy. We've got X-ray or again CK, CTKUB or X-ray KUB. So if we talk about, okay, let, let's talk about your referral. Okay, this person needs referral, right? So you, they've got a classic story of stones and they need to see a urologist. When does this person need to see a urologist? You're not admitting them today. How long have you got before this person needs to be seen? Let's, let's get some ranges of answers. So we've got within seven days, within two weeks, six weeks, 24 hours, one day, two weeks, one week, seven days, seven days, one week. 
So a lot of you guys are going back on the old guidelines. The old guidelines said within seven days. So if you're saying within seven days, you weren't wrong quite well. I don't know how many months ago, a few months ago, you weren't wrong. Now it's changed. Now you're gonna have to say 24 hours. If you're not admission, admitting someone with renal stones, you're giving them analgesia, they need imaging within 24 hours. So you'd be getting them to see urology, for example, for CTKUBs. The guideline-based treatment is a CT, but you can use ultrasound, of course, if you're pregnant, if you're a child. Um, and there are other things you can do as well, like ureteroscopies, but non-contrast CT is going to be your prime choice within 24 hours of standard uh, treatment. This, this is updated in our, for those who got your online course or audiobook course, this is updated about a month ago. So it's just changing the guidelines. So what do you do when you know they've got stones? They've had their investigations, okay, stones are there. So there's two things you can do, conservative management, watch and wait, for example, or actually go in and take out the stone or do something to it. So in terms of conservative, you could just sit there and wait. And if it's le particularly less than five millimeters in diameter, you could just say, look, it's gonna, get, it's gonna come out itself. Let's just see what happens. MET, medically explosive therapy, where you use medications, for example, alpha blockers to do the damage and get rid of the stone. Or you could physically go in and do something to the stone like we talked about. So ESWL, extra shock by lithotripsy, not invasive. You basically break the stones down and they pass through themselves. You could go in with laser, try and break that stone down. You can do a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. And in a few cases, of course, you're going to have to go in and do something about it for the open surgery when the treatment fails, if they've got complications. Um, or there are other issues going on intravenally. But generally, is it conservative? Is it stone removal? And then which format are you going to use? Is it something that can watchfully wait? Watchfully wait, is that a word? Yeah, mm, waitfully, what? waitfully, no, I don't know. You know what I mean. Or do you go in there and do something about it? But remember, the guidelines have changed recently. Fantastic. So we've covered only three things so far, but quite a lot of depth so far. CKD, we covered huge amounts. Urine abnormalities and renal stones. We've got quite a lot to cover. We're slightly behind time. Just a quick um, recap about the two courses that are coming up for AKT right now. We've got one coming up for the July exam and one coming up for the August exam. Um, we're going to give a code in two slides time to get you that 15% off. We're taking it down from 295 to 250. This is all done from home. So you get a, a mock exam done from home in exam conditions in the morning. We do a quick webinar in the morning to give you a few tips and ideas. Then you do your exam. Then we all come back in the afternoon and we do the main session where we do a lot of teaching. We, we cram in all the kind of three components and we look at technique. Why have you chosen answers? So that's coming up. The RCA courses start this Saturday. So we've got one space left on this Saturday. Then we've got one next Saturday and then the Sunday after. Um, it's quite a long day. 20 role plays live. It's all done through um, online interaction so everyone can see everyone like you're sitting in the same room. We do live role plays, but it's not CSA based. It's more kind of consultations from day-to-day -day practice, all those kind of challenging things like how do I deal with someone who's got multiple problems? How do I deal with someone who's taking my time away? How do I manage things appropriately in 10 minutes when in real life I may not do that? It's all those kinds of things and how to make the most of telephone, video, and face-to-face -face consultations. So again, 60 pound discount with, with that code if you use that code today. The competition, if you want a free AKT or CSA revision post, this is slightly different this week. What I want you to do this week is go to our main GP training support group. This is the one. This is the picture you'll be looking for. You just go to Facebook. You can do it right now. Have a look and just type in Aurora GP training support. All we want you to do is join it if you haven't joined it. If you're already a member, we want to add 10 GP trainee colleagues to your group. It might be 10 who are already GP trainee colleagues or it might be 10 who are planning to become GP trainees in the future. But if anyone who puts 10 colleagues in the group, you'll go into a hat, and then some one of you will get either an AKT revision poster or a CSA revision poster. Like I think so far, Priya we sent out three weeks ago, Said we sent out two weeks ago, Tar Cooper, like I mentioned yesterday, you could be the fourth one. These are huge, they stick on your wall, and they count you down to success in your exams. A lot of people are already joining it. Great. I'll try and add you all in in the group and then you can add 10 extra people in. So very quickly in the code to release for the 15 uses of the 15% discount, Renal Web 15, Renal Web 15. That is now live. That's going to be live until midnight or until 15 codes are gone. This is, we don't do this very often. This is everything on the website. Our three gold packages, our four or five virtual courses that we're doing, AKT, CSA, and PLAB2, all of our online bundles, all of our online courses, and all of our audiobooks. We have about 15 audiobooks, plus our online case bank, plus our vision posters. This is the code you want, RenalWeb15. There are 15, and I'm sure this will go pretty soon. So I want to leave you for two minutes. 
and we're going to come back and we're going to restart renal again okay guys we are back we're going to start in a couple of seconds a couple of questions to just fire in me, in me at whatsapp thank you by the way for everyone's adding people into the group people at a super fast speed i think we've already had about another 50 people join so thank you so much um it's the gp training support group remember there are two there's one that's run by us though so it's the dr aurora one so make sure it's that one that you're adding people into and you can get that poster um we have had nine uses of the code already so we've got another probably half an hour i reckon before those other six go um there are a few people in the checkout right now so if you want to get used to that code renal web 15 they're running out very fast and someone said is it for our goal package yes everything is included so our goal package is our is our flagship package that covers everything for akt or csa or plab 2 so that's already discounted and it's an extra 15 percent off so that is a good saving to have right so i think we are going to restart um just as soon as another question comes through no okay we're good to go right i'm just another um, reminder of our two webinars we've got this one on this thursday for the rca update and we have our six week check webinar for the akt takers if you're doing your exam in july so have a look at the website and get signed up for those We'll be covering some tips and tricks and making sure you're on track. Right. So let's go back into renal mode then. So someone comes in. Let's look at a presentation of AKI now. So we looked at the chronic renal presentation. Now you've got someone perhaps who you've got some blood test results in. You've noticed a rapid reduction in renal function. And maybe you've called them into the practice or you've called them and you've been told in an exam setting that someone's coming to see you and they've given you some blood results. What are the kind of things that you need to be doing in that type of consultation? Of course, firstly, is there any reason why I need to send this person into hospital? Again, we spend so much time sometimes, particularly in exam situations, trying to work out things like what the cause is, what the diagnosis is, what treatment is best, but we miss the fact that actually this person is not to be managed in primary care. They need secondary care admission. So look at malaise, look at fatigue, look at vomiting, look at shortness of breath. You'd think these things are pretty obvious, but remember with AKI and also any kind of renal problem, it's not obvious in terms of how unwell these people might be. What's their background? You may have obviously a background already, but you might be in an out of hour setting. You might not know anything about this patient. So you need to go back in history. Have they got heart related problems? Have they got a background of conditions like gonorrhoeophrites, which we'll talk about in a second? Have they got BPH, thinking about the obstructive causes, which we'll talk about in a second as well? Look at their meds. You know, again, we're trying to work out what condition could you have that's caused this problem. But what about the stuff that they're taking anyway? ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs, certain antibiotics, we'll cover these in more depth again in a second in the webinar and like we said do not miss the need to admit them are they unwell do you think it's polynephritis what's their potassium level could it be high are you worried about it or do we simply not know what's happening and their function is deteriorating so don't miss the acute admission so your next patient asks who has come in with potential aki could my medication doctor be the cause of this can we name let's really quickly eight medications that can cause renal impairment let's go let's see how long it takes us uh, we're at 918. Let's see. Eight causes. We've got NSAIDs, metformin, gold, ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs, ACE, NSAIDs, NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors, aminoglycosides, number four, gold, penicillamine, number five. We've got diuretics, number six, ibuprofen, yes, NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs, 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 lithium, number seven. Come on, number eight, number eight, number eight. What have we got? Metformin. Yeah, possibly metformin. I would put that in there. Maybe. I don't think it causes renal failure, but you look at um, you look at GFR when it comes to metformin. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, now lots more coming in. Cisplatin, antipsychotics, rifampicin, gentamicin, vancomycin, pregabalin. Okay, loads now are flying in. Thank you so much. Just what we took before we talk on metformin, I wouldn't put that as a cause of renal failure as such, but remember, there are two GFRs to remember when it comes to metformin. Once someone gets to a metformin, so a, a GFR 45 or less, you've got to be looking at dosing in a big way. Like, does this person need a reduction in dose? When someone gets to a GFR 30, stop stop metformin it's, you've got to remember those two numbers 30 gfr 45 gfr that's not on the webinar but it's just something definitely worth remembering so medications NSAIDs. you all think about those 
ACE inhibitors, we all think about those. The two classics, from an example point of view, penicillin and gold. Penicillin and gold, lithium. Penicillin and gold, lithium. Remember those when it comes to renal. Penicillin and gold, lithium. Phenytoin as well. Some antibiotics, like the aminoglycosides, for example, tetracyclines, penicillin, sulfonamides, rifampicin. There's some classic ones that link with renal stuff. Diuretics, of course. Don't forget that trio, penicillin and gold lithium, penicillin and gold lithium. Just get it stuck in your mind. And of course, the basic one. So if you get a role play situation and someone's taking these and you start going into all fancy reasons why someone might have renal failure, then you're going to miss the trick, right? Because common things are common and they may have just started NSAIDs, I don't know, two months ago because they've got tennis elbow and now this is all triggering off AKI. So acute loss of kidney function, of course, as, a, as opposed to chronic. You've got your pre-renal, renal, and post-renal causes. There's stuff happening before the kidney itself that's causing the kidneys to, to fail. Hypervolemia, shock, cardiac failure. Stuff within the kidney. We'll talk about nephropathies very shortly. Gamma for example, myeloma, or medications like we talked about. Or, like we mentioned earlier on, post-renal stuff after the kidney. Stones and things like BPA. So always have that kind of triple layer when it comes to thinking about what possibly could be going on. How do they present? Like we said, it could be pretty vague stuff, nausea, vomiting, dehydration, um, or they could come in classically with what you think is AKI from the moment you lay eyes on them. So it could be a vague presentation. Question nine, you think they meet the criteria for AKI. How could you use creatinine levels in your practice setting now? Let's think about it in a practice setting, GP setting, to prove they have AKI. What are you looking at in terms of numbers if you're looking at AKI. So we have 50% increase in 24 hours, increase of creatinine of 26, change of 26, greater than 1.5 baseline. Look at age, 1.5 times weight. Stage 1, 26.5 increase, 20% drop. So lots of numbers flying around, but I think the numbers kind of are in there somewhere. There's three ways you can look at creatinine, right? Well, three ways you can look at diagnosing or detecting AKI, two of which are based around creatinine. So if you've got an adult, look at their creatinine. Have you seen a rise of 26 in 48 hours? So well, if you've got 26, but make sure you get the time frame right because it's two separate time frames. Or has your creatinine risen by 50% in the last seven days, 50% in seven days or 26 units in 48 hours? Or urine output can be used to detect AKI. So if your urine output drops to less the 0.5 mil per kg per hour for over six hours, then you're looking at um, AKI as well. So three ways to remember it for things like um, PLAB2, RCA, CSA, the creatinine ones you need to know, things like AKT, all three, I think. So like we said, think admission if you're worried about causes or anything that you can't miss, like an obstructive cause. But what else are we going to do? Supportive management. Nephrotoxic drugs are going to be stopped. You've got to monitor you and you going forward, looking at things like potassium levels, optimizing fluid balance. And ultimately, of course, they may need for renal replacement therapy, which we'll talk about in a second. So multiple management plans, depending on what you think the cause is and how and well they are. But any doubt, aka you've got to think about admitting into hospital. Quick question 10, what's the main difference between glomerular nephritis and interstitial nephritis? What is the main difference? Let's see what you think. This might take a few seconds to jot something down. What have we got? So we've got answers for, so it's all about the extent of damage. We've all got, so it's about where in the kidneys damaged. Got good answer from Aberhin, Nancy, Sana, Philip, Liam, Rana. Thank you so much for answering. You're still with me. Um, yeah, loads of answers coming through now. So, tubules, glomerulus. Yes, yeah, so a lot of people saying it's all about which part of the kidney is the problem. Phoebe's saying, I have no idea. So it's about yeah, which part of the kidney is inflamed or damaged. So in glomerular nephritis, as the name suggests, it's the glomerular area that's caused, that's the problem. Whereas in interstitial nephritis, it's the renal interstitium. So distinctly not the glomerular area. Now this is kind of back to um, anatomy stuff in med school, right? Which part of the kidney is what? But let's start with glomerular nephritis because this again, from an exam point of view, is always a classic. So glomerulonephritis is a group of disorders, immune-based disorders, which ultimately all lead to inflammation of the glomeruli. That's the whole point of glomerulonephritis. It could be primary, so we don't know why it happens, it just happens, 
or it could be part of a different condition. So secondary gonadotropin, things like SLE, polyarthritis nodosa, those are the commonest ones that will come up in things like exams. Four main types, and there are some cat there's, there's things that, that you want to kind of link with all these four types. So minimal change gonadotropin is the one that you often see in children. Minimal change often seen in children. You could have diffuse gonadotropin where all of the gonadotropin are affected. You can have focal glomerulonephritis, which affects only some of the glomeruli, and then you can have segmental, where only parts of the glomerulus are, are affected. So depending on how many or which part of the glomerulus is, is, is uh, affected, you can then categorize it into these four common types, minimal change, diffuse, focal, and segmental. How does it present? Various ways. It could be just simple on a urine dipstick. You pick up some blood, you pick up some protein. That could be the first sign. It could be nephrotic syndrome, it could be nephritic syndrome, we'll talk about in a second. And of course, it could present with AKI and it could present with a chronic renal deterioration. So a huge array of different presentation types when it comes to glenophritis. Because there are so many different reasons for this to happen, primary, secondary, et cetera, there are lots of investigations that need to happen. So it could be a biopsy, which ultimately will give you some good some good information, or to antibodies, look for the various different causes, complement levels, which may be useful when you look into all that things like SLE, and of course, we will have things like myeloma as well. So using immunoglobulins. So a huge array of investigations, including, of course, things like normal renal function. Management depends a little bit on the type that you're thinking about, but generally it's going to include things like steroids, immunoglobulins, sometimes antithrombotics, and eventually renal replacement therapy like dialysis if it's reached that point. So it kind of has a lot of things. Uh, Glorinophytes all have some things in common, but because there are so many different types with so many different features, every presentation is going to be individual. But it's worth um, making that difference from this and interstitial nephritis, which is where the renal interstitium is inflamed, not the glomerulus. Again, can be due to drugs and all the drugs that we mentioned earlier on, but it can be due to infection and again, secondary to other conditions like SLE. Can present again with a range of things, AKI, for example, but more rare things as well, things that may be associated with the other conditions like fevers and rashes. And again, depends on the extent, the age, the comorbidities, but steroids may help in management in quite a few cases of interstitial nephritis. Quick question 11, I'm sure you're gonna get this bit right. What is a classic triad of nephritic syndrome? The classic triad of nephritic syndrome. Uh, down to two codes, guys, if you're looking, two codes are left. If you're still on trying to get one of these discounted, uh, two of these, that's okay, Renal Web 15. Classic triad of nephritic syndrome. So we've got a lot of answers coming in here. Hematuria, hypertension, proteinuria, edema, proteinuria, proteinuria, hematuria, hypertension, reduced urine output, proteinuria, edema, oliguria, hypertension, hypertension, proteinuria, abdo pain, leg swelling. Okay, so quite a, a range of different answers here. Red blood cell casts, oliguria. Classic trio, they often get confused. Nephrotic, nephritic. Nephrotic and nephritic are very different, of course. Nephrotic is probably the one that people learn easier for some reason. This classic trio of proteinuria, edema, and hypoalbuminemia. That's your nephrotic syndrome. Nephritic syndrome does have other things, but the classic trio that's worth remembering is hematuria, edema, and uremia. Make sure you try and get these differentiated somehow in your mind. There's not an easy way, I don't think, to do it, but if you can get these two triangles sorted out in your mind, then it, then it can help with a lot of different um, classic exam type questions, nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome. Some renal vascular stuff then, so renal vein thrombosis and then renal artery stenosis. So renal vein thrombosis, essentially either one or both of your renal veins become blocked because of something like nephrotic syndrome like we just talked about or things like renal carcinomas. It can be an acute problem, it could be a chronic problem depending on what the underlying cause is. It might cause symptoms, it might not, but it may just present with reduced renal function. Of course, you wanna go in and try and figure out where the blockage is, so things like Doppler ultrasound scans, CT MRIs, and depending on what you think the cause is, you may need to go in with things like warfarin or streptokinase, but sometimes you have to surgically go in and remove that thrombus at that point. Renal artery stenosis, for some reason, you're getting reduced blood supply to the kidney, commonly due to atherosclerosis. So if someone's got a history of angina, MI, stroke, TIA, PVD, all the classic cardiovascular disorders, then there may be an element of renal artery stenosis going on. 
or a slightly more uncommon cause is fibromuscular hyperplasia. Eventually, it may present with hypertension. It may present with hyperaldosteronism. Your kidney is shrunken over time, so it's a smaller kidney. And then you just like think of it as a, an MI or reduced blood supply and peripheral vascular disease, you may need angioplasty to go in there and get rid of that stenosis, as long as it's kind of an atherosclerosis cause. So renal artery stenosis, renal vein thrombosis, worth getting these two met in your mind. And number 12, what are the two main types of dialysis? So we're reaching that end stage renal function now. What are the two main types? So we have peritoneal and hemodialysis. So well done if you got those two. So essentially your the body is not the, the kidneys are not functioning enough to be able to to to, to function in, in in all the kind of solution chain exchange that needs to happen. So you need to go in there and find a way to do it for that patient. So hemodialysis is where blood comes out of this out of the body goes through an external dia dialyzer and the substances pass in and out of an artificial membrane problems are you've got to get vascular access quite a lot there could be some cardiovascular effects because you're using the cardiovascular system so hemodialysis blood is taken out of the system goes into a dialyzer things go in and out and then it goes back into the body peritoneal dialysis you're not using an artificial membrane here you're using your your own the the patient's own peritoneum is the membrane through which things flow in and out. So a fluid, diacylate fluid, is passed into someone's abdominal cavity, filtration all happens, and then that fluid is removed again six to eight hours later. Now you can imagine when you're going in and putting fluid in and out, there are certain complications that come with doing this, leakage, peritonitis, electrolyte imbalance. So th there's no, there's no like some people hemodialysis suits much better, some people peritoneal dialysis suits better. But the, the main difference is the membrane is external in hemodialysis and is inside the patients themselves when it's peritoneal dialysis. And of course, if these fail, then you may be looking at things like renal transplants, which come with all their, their issues of immunosuppression and, and all those kind of medications that are needed for that as well. So that's your kind of more end stage renal failure. Fantastic. Well done. So we got through bang on time again. Um, quite a few things. So CKD issues, urine abnormalities, renal stones, AKI, nephritis, renal vascular stuff, nephrotic, nephritic, and finally end stage Damage. In mind of the competition, we've got quite a few people in it today by the looks of it. So if you want to add 10 people into our main national GP training support group, you could have an AKT or a CSA poster on the way in the next couple of days. Remember our two webinars coming up this Thursday, just one day break, and then we're back on again for the RCA update webinar. And then this time next week, replacing this lockdown webinar, we're going to do our AKT six-week check webinar to make sure six weeks away from your exam, are you on track? Are we keeping you in the loop? Don't forget how many codes left. One second. Before I tell you, go ahead. One. We're down to the last one. The last code is available. Renal Web 15. If you want to grab that 15% discount on anything on our website now, just that is the code that you need. Renal Web 15. That will cut once someone goes in and makes that final purchase. Our groups have changed, guys, at the moment. We did have AKT, CSA, PLAB. Uh, GP entry and our main group, but now we, we, we're putting everything back into our main GP training support group. All of our teaching is going here. So if you're a member of our AKT or our CSA specific or our GP entry one, those groups are now closing. It's worth joining our main GP training group because what we realize is a lot of the queries and questions that come for the various exams are useful for people being in the main group as well. So we're going back to this. We've still got our PLAB support group because that's a, a different kettle of fish altogether. And then there's our main page as well, where we do all of our teaching, Dr. Amin Avora. We've got our daily emails. We've got Instagram. We've got YouTube. We've got Twitter. Instagram has flown since we started doing this webinar. So many of you have been kind enough to follow us on Instagram, where we can teach you every day through pictures and colors and images. So please do have a look at our Instagram feed. Get out your phone right now. Have a look at it. Um, check it out. If you like it, then follow. This Thursday, RCA update. Next Tuesday, AKT update webinar. Thank you so much for your time, guys. Thank you so much for your attention and for your support over the last nine weeks. I'll be seeing you again for the update webinars. I'll be staying back now to go through the questions.